come I always have to start the episode? Okay, I'll I never start it. What I'm supposed to say. Hey, yo, people! <laughs> what up? It's Ashley. <laughs> yo, it's Aspen, the better half of the Summers twins, but not the best half, cause I am. That sounded pretty gangster. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Is that offensive? <laughs> what gangster? Yeah. To people who are in gangs? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. Well, if you're offended by that, we didn't mean to. <laughs> Today, we have an awesome episode for you with some awesome guests. But first, it is time for our Good News Minute. Inspirational in it. It is not a Good News Minute because you voted that you thought Aspen's name was stupid and mine was better. My name, Good News Minute, not my name, Aspen. My name, Aspen, is amazing. That was my parents' favorite name, and they gave it to me because I'm their favorite. Because they thought you were going to die. No, that's just the story they tell. Everyone knows the kid with the favorite name is always the least favorite. What? And the baby is always the favorite, and I'm the baby. No, the older is the favorite because they've been known them for a long time. Well, when you were born, you were taken away because you were choking, so they really knew me for longer. Yeah, but I'm around more now, so they know me better. Okay, that was our <laughs> inspirational in it. See no, you next it week. <laughs> no, it wasn't. For our inspirational in it today, I am going to tell you all about museums, which may sound boring, but it's not, so just listen. So the first museum that I found is called the Museum of Happiness, and it is in Copenhagen, Denmark, and it is part of the Happiness Research Institute, which first of all just sounds like an amazing company. Like who wouldn't want to live at the, ha- I mean work at the Happiness <laughs> Research Institute, but now they have a museum open to the public, and it's devoted to studying happiness and teaching people how to be happier in their daily lives, and There is an exhibit where people can leave post-it notes with happy memories from their life, which I think is just really fun, because who doesn't need more happiness? Yeah, that's so cute. Yeah. Like, can people read the post-it notes, or they just, like, take them down? No, they leave them up. (laughs) Well, I figured, but I don't know. Okay, but then the other museum is a traveling exhibit, which started out in Sweden in 2017, but is now in New York City. So if you live on the East Coast, go visit it. It's in Brooklyn. And it is called the Museum of Failure, which I think is pretty cool because they have exhibits of all of these products that people invented that were failures and flops and didn't work out, which first of all is cool because we kind of try to hide failure a lot, I think. But At this museum, you can, like, see all of these things that failed and then see that a lot of the companies are still doing pretty well. But also, some of these things are really funny. Like, who came up with these product ideas? Okay, listen to these. Limeade-flavored Oreo cookies and Colgate lasagna. Like, Colgate the toothpaste? Yes. It was mint-flavored lasagna. Oh, that's disgusting. First of all, why wouldn't you call it, like grasshopper lasagna or mint chocolate lasagna or like colgate that's disgusting i don't know i mean no offense to whoever invented that but well you know what i saw the other day what they have a ranch dressing flavored ice cream i saw that too which i mean we should get it and try it and then review it on our next episode (laughs) I feel like it was like $6 for a pint. I'm not sure I want to spend that kind of money. Maybe we can get them to send us some for free. Yeah. I'll email them. Okay, but then we would have to have a good review of it. Well, are you saying you don't think it would be good? No comment. Okay. Well, maybe someday it'll be in the Museum of Failure. Maybe. Ranch dressing is still doing pretty well for themselves. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Speaking of people who are doing well for themselves... Today we have Winston and Mel on. Winston and Mel are the hosts of Winston and Mel in the Morning, the coolest radio show in Denver, which is on Cool 105. And they have a really interesting story of how they ended up both in radio and then how they ended up doing this show together in Colorado. And 
If you are from Colorado, you might be familiar with Winston and Mel already, but I've listened to their show before and I never knew this story until we got to talk to them. So it was just such a great experience to get to interview them and hear their story. And we hope that you enjoy Winston and Mel. Yeah. (laughs) You guys are all grown up. I can't believe it. I know. We can't believe it either. Not sure how that happened so fast. It does. Well, before we get started, we just want to thank you guys so much for doing this. We're really excited to get to talk to you. Absolutely. So I guess our first question is just, we were wondering how you guys both got started in radio, if it was always something you dreamed of, or what was kind of the jumping off point that started your careers in radio? Okay, you go. You go. Yours is longer. (laughs) Uh, Mine was just, I uh, when I I went to college, I had no idea what I was going to do. And I saw there was a lab for a radio station on the campus, and it was just broadcast broadcast closed circuit to the dorms. And so I did that, really enjoyed it, and just kept going. Made his father proud. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) He wanted me to go in the military, but no, didn't want to do that. Not at that time. So I started in 2005. I worked at Starbucks for Mm -hmm. eight years, and I had my daughter. She was young. She was only three years old at the time. And when I was in Starbucks, I got into management and I was either opening or closing or working a mid shift. So it wasn't working around my daughter's schedule. And I asked one of my customers who was operations manager for Clear Channel in Bakersfield in California at the time. And I was like, hey, I want an internship at the radio station. He goes, send me your resume. So that day I got hired on as a promotions assistant. I would go out um, five to 15 hours a week. I'd set up tables and tents and the sound system for the DJs and I'd go and, and run around for them. And then when I met him in 2010, he came out from San Antonio. We met at the same radio station and I was his promotions director. And so I did all the behind the scenes stuff. And then one day he just said, Hey, I got a story to tell you come in the studio. And I was like, all right. So I go and I sit up on the counter. I throw the microphone in my face and went with it. A week later, he's like, I want you to do the morning show with me. I go, what? (laughs) I had had no idea that that's what I was going to do. Wow. So had you ever thought that you would want to be in front of the microphone or had that like never even crossed your mind? Not even cross my mind. I did a couple of commercials here and there. You know, when the production guy, he goes, I need a different voice. Uh, Come in here. And when I worked for Clear Channel, they actually said I would never be on the air. They didn't, I guess they didn't like how, because there's radio people and then there's personalities. I'm a personality. I'm somebody that you can either take or not. (laughs) There is no in between. Now, Winston is very much the professional radio guy. He does all of his research. He finds the stories, but I'm the one that reacts. But him and I, when we met, it was like we were never strangers. Right. And that's what really makes a big difference. And when, especially when you have a morning show duo is the chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. And and ours was, it it was like, it was always, it was always there. Yeah. And they told us when we were in California and I was trying to convince our general manager to let her go on the air with me, uh, they were like, well, she's never done radio before. And I said, that's, that's not an issue. That's not, that's not what this is about. It's about doing a morning show. It's a different kind of approach. And I know it would work. They didn't believe us. And eventually we left there and, and got a job offer to come out to Denver and meet your dad. Yeah. And then, uh, you, you know, guys don't know it, but the, the great candy run was our very first event in Denver. When we came out, that, or he told me that actually. Yeah, yeah. it was our very first. It was so cold. <laughs> yeah, because we, yeah, we weren't used to that cold, man. Yeah. So, but it was awesome. So, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I feel like that event is either really nice weather or it's unbearably cold. So, I guess you guys got one of the unlucky, unbearably cold years. Um. So, Winston, what made you so confident that Mel would be a perfect fit for the show if she had never done? radio before and then Mel when he asked you to do the show with him were you like what are you talking about or were you like totally let me just jump in and do it what were your thoughts about it she was freaked (laughs) out no I I knew it would work just based upon how well we get along and her personality and I knew that if I was running the board and kind of you know trying to keep her within a certain boundary that it would work and I just, I had faith. I just, I could hear it in her voice. I knew what would go and we just took off and I never had any doubts. 
And yeah, I mean, I had all the faith in the world that he knew what he was doing because he'd been doing it a lot longer than I had. Um, I was I was really content in doing the behind the scenes stuff. I really liked. I would do a lot of festivals. Um, we had Spanish stations and I would, you know, set up these festivals. And so I really liked the end results of that and having a crew and, and doing all the beginning to end stuff. But going on the air was a different element, one that I wasn't familiar with. And that fascinated me because why would this guy want me to go on the air with him when there were there were a lot of radio personalities trying to get back on the radio at that time and then when in 2015 when he got let go where we were and i was left there it was basically hey you got you're now doing everything production promotions you're the only live on air you're doing the websites you're doing this radio was no longer fun i didn't have my best friend there i didn't have my mentor so for me i was I was ready to get out in 2015 till so he calls me up and said, Hey, um, we have a you know, phone interview with some folks in Denver. And I was like, Denver, I won't tell you what exactly I said, but it was a bad word, bad word. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? Let's do it. Let's go for it. Because yeah. he was looking for work in anywhere in the country, but this was the only one he sent our dual air checks too and so we had the, the phone interview on a thursday on friday we got the job offer we had three weeks to be out here from california oh wow that's crazy how fast it was um but i love that you talk about how it was no longer fun and that you were really prioritizing fun because i think that's so important to do something that's fulfilling to you and I feel like it's so easy to just get stuck in the trap of this is what I've been doing. This is what I know how to do and never really stop to think about, is this what I want to do? Is this fulfilling to me? And so I think that's just really important that you were able to kind of figure that out. You know, like for her, that was a big deal, uh, you know, to leave Bakersfield and just step into the unknown and step into doing a morning show in a major market, in a big market. So that was a big leap of faith on her part. For me, I was looking forward to it because I worked in a fairly good sized market, not as one as big as Denver, but I knew how much fun it could be and I knew how exciting it could be. And that's why I just basically said, you, you got you to gotta take this job. You got to come out here because it's going to change your life. And, uh, and it did, you know, and for both of us, it's been a great thing. So. Absolutely. And one thing, you know, I've been working since I was 14 years old, different jobs. I've never had the opportunity to go to college, but I always told myself, I'm not going to have roots. If I have somewhere else that I can go and, and be successful at, I got to take that chance because the worst that's going to happen is I have to go home. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I took it. I really, really leaned on him. Like we lived together for four and a half years out here because I mean, my, my family didn't come out here with me or anything. So him and I, we were roommates, we we're best friends, and we did a morning show together. So that's, that's a lot in itself. So to make that actually successful, and here we are almost seven years later, it, it, doesn't even, it still doesn't feel real. So was it ever hard for you guys, since you were roommates and best friends, to get along and to be also working together? Because... Like, I know for us, we work together, but we also live together and we've known each other our whole lives. And so, like, we know what presses each other's buttons. And sometimes it can be hard when we have conflicts to deal with those since we're so close and um, kind of separate work and our friendship. So I guess, how did you guys deal with conflicts and was it ever difficult to get along and to work together? Well, you know, I think I think both of us are pretty lighthearted. So, um we have very similar um, sense of humors. Right. I get his dark humor. <laughs> I might be darker. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, no, I mean it's it's always worked out. And then, like I said, you know, we it was actually my girlfriend that suggested that we live together because you know, and she said, "What's the point of you guys being in different places, having to pay double the rent?" So we just moved in and had more fun because of that. It was like the odd couple. It was, yeah. it was pretty funny. It would have been hilarious if we would have had like video cameras because it was, yes. it was ridiculous. It was like a, a it's a, it's almost like a brother sister relationship. You know, there are times that I've irritated him. And it, the one thing is, is that I don't, I don't like to disappointment him. It's, it's worse than if I disappointed my dad, like seriously. <laughs> and he has, 
the same birthday as my father, only he's a year younger. Oh, wow. So there's that, that link of, of kinship, you know? So, and I'm very much a nurturer at heart. So I love to cook and I love to clean and I always like to make sure that he was, you know, taken care of and whatnot. So it, it he was probably by far the best roommate I've ever had. And I've had a lot. Um, it was, it was fun. I thought it was entertaining. Yeah, we had, we, had, we, had, <laughs> we had a lot of fun. We really did. We had a good time. And I think that what we knew about each other, if we did have a conflict or there was a, uh, you know, we just didn't agree on something. We just kind of walk away and then reconvene yeah, and work it out and work it out yeah. because we knew we had to wake up next day with each other not with each other but the next day <laughs> go to work and still do our thing be winston and mel right do you feel like because you talk about having to be winston and mel do you feel like you're ever putting on a show or having to put on these identities that people expect you to be rather than being able to be yourselves absolutely yeah absolutely you gotta you gotta do that all the time you know, a friend of mine told me, he said, rule number one, you always got to sound like you're having a good time. And so no matter how you feel, no matter how tired you are or how upset you are or what bad things are going on in your life, when you turn that microphone on, you got to turn it on. You got to be there. Uh, you know, you can bring those things that are happening in your life onto the air with you, those personal things, but you can't let it really affect your performance. You still got to perform no matter what. And, and we do. I mean, there's like this morning, we were both exhausted because I didn't sleep good. She had a water pipe bust in her house last <laughs> night. So both of us were going like on three hours of sleep, but we still, we pulled it off, you know, so. Yeah, my, uh, my first year here, I left my daughter, my husband, my mom was sick. My sister just had a baby. I'm in a new city, new job, new friends. And my mom passed away also in that year. So there were so many different elements that would come at me on a daily basis, on a daily basis. But I would have to go in there and I have to block it out. Uh, I went on the air two days after my mom passed away right. and I shared the story. You know, um, I lost her to breast cancer. And so it was my opportunity to be like, you know, early detection, best prevention. So I'm able to turn that into advocacy. Even though I lost my mom, I can still turn it around into something positive. And that's what I think that not everybody has that ability to do so. Um, everyone thinks that they could be in radio until they actually do it and understand what goes along with it. Because emotions, you can have them, but you can't lean on them. Right. And you got to, and whatever emotions you do have, you got to control. Them. Yeah. And, you know, and yeah, and you have to be a little bit more theatrical than you, than you would in just a normal conversation with someone. When we're on the air, we do get a little bit more theatrical and, you know, laugh a little bit more. And, you know, just like I said, you just got to be able to turn it on yeah. when the time comes. Mm -hmm. That's all. For the most part, do you feel like that's helpful to have that skill and be able to kind of turn your emotions off when you need to? Or is it more difficult that you can't really share your whole selves with the public? Yeah, it is. It is very difficult because there's some things that you're not going to talk about or you're not going to get into that would serve no purpose. And so you got to just kind of hold that in and push it in the back of your brain, you know, and we, we've done that many times, you know. So, yeah, that that aspect of it can be tough. But, you know, like I said, we got a job for four and a half hours that we're in that room that we got to be on and we got to sound like we're having a good time. And I'll tell you, time. after that four hours, it feels like you ran a marathon because there's so much energy put behind it. So you are, you're exhausted yeah. afterwards mm -hmm. and you just have to, it's what I've, what I've found out. It It's not just a job, a career. It's a lifestyle. Every, almost every moment of your life is in seconds because you're always waiting for the seconds for the song to end and what you're going to talk about, what you're going to say that's going to actually mean something when you open up that microphone. And when we're in that studio, I swear, it feels like it's just him and I talking and we're not talking to all of Denver. We're just in there. He'll bring up a subject, we'll, you know, uh, one of the stories and we'll just run with it. Everything is pretty much improv in that studio. And so it, it helps us to not overthink it. So do you feel like since it is just the two of you, are you aware of the audience? Do you feel like you have a purpose of what you want the audience to take away from your show each morning? Or 
does it really just feel secluded between the two of you? Well, it is for the most part, it's it's just us, but we do try to pull them in. Like we'll get onto a topic about something and Mel will see something. I'm like, well, you know, you're out of your mind. And then we'll say, well, give us a call right now. Has Mel lost your mind or not? And then pull the people into the conversation and, and let them be part of it. Yeah. And I think, well, that's one thing we try to do is they are very much part of what we do because we have a Facebook page and we constantly are interacting with them on there. And we try to pull them into the discussions that we have. And, you know, and a lot of times we just kind of go back and forth and people will just call up and uh, they just kind of jump in and be part of what we're doing. Yeah, we have a lot. We have a lot of regular listeners that love to be a part of the show every day. Then there's the ones that have called for the first time and we've never heard from them before. But at the same time, too, you know, like my laugh is very distinct. I don't know if you guys have ever listened, but I'll get I'll get pinpointed in a restaurant if I'm out with friends away from work. So I have to be very cognizant of of my behavior a lot of times. And so the, the energy you have to put forth on a daily, it's, it's almost like Groundhog's Day every day. You know right. what yeah, I mean? It is. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's just like, okay, let's do this again. I, I react to his energy because if I'm too much, I, I have to bring it down a notch so we can be more balanced because I'll stand out way too much. And then, you know, he's not having fun then. And I, I know this. So you have to be very aware of, who you are interacting with. And right. that's why we, we work so good together. Yeah. And I, and you know, part of my job is to entertain her and to make her laugh. So with the stories that I bring in, I think, or I hope that she's going to find them interesting and I don't tell her ahead of time and then spill the story out and then she reacts and we go back and forth. And that's, that's usually how it goes. Yeah. Cause I can only rely on that stupid face so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's, probably a big reason why your show is so popular and why so many people love listening to you because you guys have such a close relationship and it's the kind of relationship I mean from listening to you guys at least it sounds like the kind of relationship that everybody kind of wishes they had and wants to emulate so do you have any advice for people who might be needing a relationship like your guys is in their lives on how to cultivate relationships like that and you talk about that you get along so well, so how to, I guess, how to maintain a relationship like that? Yeah, I think that's, that's, a, uh, that's, a, that's a good question, and, it, and it's true. I think, and this is probably true in any relationship, uh, not that we're in a relationship. No, not even close. Yes. But <laughs> you you got you to gotta kind of lose your ego. You, you have an ego. You've got to have an ego to do this job, but you've got to lose your ego. I mean, I don't care who gets the punchline. I, I don't care. She doesn't care. And so we'll go back and forth. And as soon as one of us hits what we think is a really good punchline, boom, we'll go into the commercials at that point in time. So you, you can't have a big ego. You got to just, you know, we share the, the spotlight or whatever you want to call it. And that, it, 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 the bottom line is, does it benefit the show? I mean, what, what, makes, what makes it more entertaining? What, what makes people want to listen? And so, yeah, I, I could care less, you know, who, who is, you know, we're not important. It's a team. It's very much a team thing. So, yeah, I think you got to lose the ego. I think that's like number one. Yeah. And we're one entity. It's Winston and Mel. It's right. not Winston and Mel. You know, we we are very genuine people. We both he's he's been there through me for some of my darkest, darkest moments. And so for him to have not been judgmental and he always does, you know, try to lift me up and be that positive force that I needed at times. Um, I've, I've been able to overcome. I, I could have cut bait and bailed and, and went back home. Um, but I did it. And it, a lot of that has to do with him. And I think that when you, when you find that person that you can really relate to, you have to hang on to them. You know, we don't talk about divisive subjects. We don't talk politics. We don't talk about religion. We don't talk about all the bad stuff in the world because you get that everywhere. So why would anyone want to listen to more of it? Right. Yeah. So we just don't do it. They can get it other places. But yeah. Not with us. So we just try to be different. We try to stand out and be who we are, where people can be like, man, I could actually have a beer with those guys. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's what I love about your guys' show and really why we started this podcast, because we feel like there's just so much negativity in the world. And it's really hard to wake up every morning and just be bombarded with negative, negative, negative on TV and when you look at your phone and everywhere. And so... I think it's just really amazing and inspiring that you guys are that source of positivity and 
joy really for the people who listen to you. Yeah. And we just, we just try to have a good time. You know, if we, if we are having a good time in there and people are listening, they're going to, they're going to feel it. They're going to get a little bit. It's just like if you go to a concert, you watch a performer. If the person up on stage looks like they're not having a good time, you're not going to enjoy the show. But if it's somebody that looks like they're just having a blast, it gets you sucked into that feeling. And I think that's kind of what we do in, 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 a, in a smaller way. For sure. And as you get older, your relationships with people change. When you're, when you're younger, I wouldn't say friends are disposable, but they serve a different purpose. If somebody isn't bringing happiness or, you know, drama free into your life, why do you want them around? You know, why do you want to keep that negative energy around you? Cause it's only going to bring you down. So I find that, you know, the friendship that, that him and I have, I could come to him for anything and vice versa. Yeah. And it's not just a work relationship. There are a lot of shows that are only work related at that's it. Um, but we do things outside of work because that's something else we could bring to the table. That's right. something else we could talk about. You know, our adventures uh, with Winston and Mel are, are pretty cool. Like, um, uh, like when she threw up in my car. Yeah, I threw up in his car. I mean. <laughs> That's a different story. That's okay. <laughs> Completely different story. Um, when I went off the balcony to try and get the icicle off and you were like, no, don't jump. <laughs> right. Stuff like that. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's fun. And I think when you get older, you have to nurture those really close relationships a little bit more. You have to give them a little bit more attention, but in a different way. I mean, I feel like we are pretty lucky because we were just born into this really close relationship. And obviously there's times where we just want to be our own people or want to get away from each other. But I feel like over the last few years, we've really just embraced that we are always going to be Aspen and Ashley because we have a lot of fun together and we love working together and we know that we're really lucky to have this relationship. I don't think it's a relationship that we could possibly have with anybody else. Right, right. exactly. And there's there's nobody on the planet that's closer to you genetically than our. Yep. So yeah, absolutely. It makes sense. You yeah. definitely have to have your own identities. But remember, you know, your strengths can bring out her, you know, help her with her weaknesses and vice versa. And I think that that's very important to kind of don't look at the, the bad part of it, but just be like, you know, we can look at this in a different in a different way. Um, I mean, by your by yourself, you guys are obviously very talented. Yeah. But together, you know, powerhouse. you guys, yeah, a powerhouse. Exactly. That's the way I think you, you got to look sure. at it. Yeah. So. So going back to earlier, you were saying that you guys do a lot of things outside of your show, and you said that the Candy Run was the first event that you did here in Colorado. So can you talk a little bit about how you use your platform to support the community and to support causes that you guys are passionate about? Yeah, you know, a lot of times we get, you know, we'll get approached and someone will ask us, you know, if we'd like to do the event or if we can, and a lot of it just gets mm -hmm. down to time time constraints, but it's always nice when you find something, you know, like the candy run uh, that you think is a great cause and it's just a fun event. I mean, you can't go wrong doing stuff like that. And, uh, you know, Mel is really good about finding organizations like that that we've gotten involved with and, and done stuff that sounds good on the air and that everybody benefits from. So. Absolutely. And that's one of my you know, I get to spend four and a half hours in the studio every day with my best friend, but that's not why my passion for radio is is so deep. And that's because when I come to when I came to this community, uh, I didn't know anything about Denver. I didn't know anything about Colorado, but I wanted to know more about it. So getting involved in nonprofit organizations not only gets me to you know branch out a little bit, but also get to know who needs the voice to be heard. And I'm, I'm involved in the MC for the Making Strides Against Breast Cancer Walk. We are going to be emceeing uh, Suds for SIDS for Angel Eyes on Saturday, I'm involved with the Rocky Mountain Blood, um, Blood Cancer Leukemia Center, also Feeding Denver's Hungry. There's so many that, I, I mean, we could wrap our arms around so many. Uh, but that's why I have like Colorado Conversation on Sunday mornings where I can showcase certain nonprofits that need their voice to be heard, whether they have an event or they just need to get their nonprofit exposed. So that means the world to me because I can, I, I love doing that in the studio with him, but my passion is helping others. I love that. 
Um, and I'm curious, now that you guys have been in Colorado for many years, what do you think about it? Do you like it more than California? Have you been converted yet? I love it way more. I, it's, I've lived in quite a few places, and uh, this is like, it's the, the coolest place I've ever lived. I love it because there's so many things to do. It's beautiful. you got the Rocky Mountains. And if you, you know, there's like a, so many events, so many things you can go check out. And if you ever get bored, you just go up to the mountains. Yep. Yeah, it's beautiful. So, yeah, it's amazing. It's an amazing place. It really is. I've been very lucky. I met my soulmate here, um, him and his daughters. We bought a house. Uh, we, we have a beautiful life. I don't even remember. And I lived in California all my life. This is home. This has become my home. Um, I'm constantly wanting to do things. If I don't, it's because I need some rest. <laughs> but, you know, the atmosphere that we have here, the people, um, the things, the things to do, there's always, there's always something. And I think that that keeps us going every, every single day for sure. Yeah. You know, we moved to California for college and when I was in high school, I was like, I'm so done with Colorado. I'm so ready to get out of here. And like every time we would have people over, we would always go for a hike and go to the mountains. And I was like, this is so boring. When I get to California, there's going to be so much more cool things to do. And then like two weeks after I got to LA, I was like, I want to go for a hike. I miss the snow. But you know, but that's great. That's what you do. You you go to different places. Yeah. And then you can really, then you can realistically compare and you realize, you know what? it really is better over here or I don't like it there or yeah. So you, you got to take advantage of, you know, those opportunities like going to college in California, you mm -hmm. got, you got to do that. The opportunity presents itself. You got to do it while yeah. you can. Like I said, don't ever have roots. Always make, you know, the next leap that you have to, because mom and dad are going to be there. <laughs> no matter what, no matter how old our kids get, we will always be there. And uh, you know, my daughter, she's 20 now. And unfortunately has no desire to branch out and, and, and I've given her every opportunity to come out here, but she, she feels safe there, you know, but sometimes you got to get out of your, your safe zone and you have no idea what you could be missing out on. If I would have said no to Winston, my life would have been exponentially different. Like it would, it, there's no way I could even fathom what my life would have been like, but I had a leap of faith, not just in him, but in myself as a woman, because I I, li I work in a very male dominant, you know, career choice. So you have to make your mark, and I think I've done okay. Yeah, you've done all right. All right. <laughs> Good. Mel, I was going to ask you along the lines of talking about this being a very male dominated industry. Um, and earlier you were saying that you have a really big personality. Is it hard for you to feel like you can be yourself because I feel like there's a lot of pressure on women, especially in male dominated industries to, you know, be more ladylike and quiet and things like that. Or because you have such a big platform, do you feel like you've sort of gained freedom to be yourself? Oh, well, Winston, number one, is probably my biggest fan and my biggest supporter for the simple fact that within two weeks of being out here, I was in tears probably eight times because we got the phone call. Her laugh is annoying. She's annoying. I can't stand this morning show there. I mean, it was, there was emails coming in constantly, constantly. And I had to, I had to really block it out. I had to, I had to not listen. And I was like, I'm going to ruin your career. <laughs> He's been doing it for a thousand years and it's going to be done like just because I'm here. Right. So it was, it was very, it was very hard for me not to get down on myself, but that's because he was like, no, I, you can't change. I need you to be who you are because that's what makes us different. That's, that's yeah. I knew that's what's going to make it work. So, you know, you just got to have faith and push on. And, yeah. Yeah, and you always are going to have people, especially if you, Especially if you do something a little different, especially if you don't do it exactly like the person before you did it, you're always going to have someone that's going to push back and go, well, that's not the way we did it before. They may be right. Uh, but, you know, if you really believe in what you're doing and you have faith, then you, you got to push forward and you just keep going and you work harder and harder and you work harder than the next guy and you prove them wrong. You know, and that's that's to me, that's a, a good bit of revenge. You know, when you can, when you can prove somebody wrong, you know, they say, yeah. Hey, you guys are going to be terrible. No, we're not. Yeah, like our, our former general manager said, people just don't get you. And they separated us. And uh, that's when Winston 
was let go and he put out all these feelers and now i mean we've we've done pretty well yeah we're I doing mean, good we've we've been, we've uh, the ratings have been very good we've hit number one many times i think 10 out of the last 12 months last year uh last year we won the colorado broadcasters association uh, morning show of the year uh so you know all that stuff is like really we did great so you're wrong. yeah so yeah. that guy was completely off mark right so <laughs> But that's what you got to do. You know, yeah. if you if you believe in what you're doing, just work harder. Yeah. Just work harder at it. You know, prove them, prove them wrong. Yeah, definitely. Because the one person who may not like my laugh, but there's 25 others that do. Am I going to change myself for that one person who doesn't like it, or keep myself the same for the 25 who do? So I have to really be cognizant of it. Sometimes I can be a bit too much. I'm not a girly girl, you know, I'm, I'm cars, football, you know, music. I'm, I'm not high heels and makeup and purses. I'm not like that. So I can relate to a lot of the women out there who just want to be who they are. Yeah. I love that because I think that it can be so easy for so many people to get hung up on the one person who doesn't like something about you. Like we both definitely do that because we're both huge people pleasers. So we just can't stand it when somebody doesn't like something that we did and we want to please them. So we want to change so we can make everybody happy. And I, and I get that, but there's something you got to look at. Like you think about one of your pay, favorite performers. So there's an artist that you really like. Uh, I guarantee you there are people that hate them and think they're horrible, you know, but they can't adjust what they do to that, that small percentage. They got to be who they are. And, you know, it's like pink. Mm -hmm. The artist pink. A lot of people don't like her. But, man, she's stuck to her guns and she does her own thing. And I think she's brilliant, mm -hmm. you know. So, I mean, you just got to, if somebody says, no, nah, like, you, you got to get a thick skin. If you're going to put yourself out there. Yeah. Like, you know, like you girls are. If you're going to put yourself out there, you got to have a thick skin. Mm -hmm. You got to let it roll off your back, you know, and just believe in what you're doing and just keep doing it. Yeah, I think that's great advice, not just for people who are in the public eye, but even anybody who's just trying to be like a good mom or a good friend or anything, because everything that we do, you're going to have doubts, but you just need to really believe in what you're doing, even in the hard times. Yeah. Just, you know, if you're, if you got a good heart and you believe in what you're doing, just do it. Just yeah. push forward, just push through it. Well, I know we've taken a lot of your time, so we should wrap up soon, but we have two questions that we like to ask all of our guests. Um, so first of all, do either of you have an inspirational quote that you would want to share with our listeners? Do you? Oh, an inspirational quote. I got two. <laughs> okay. I got two. <laughs> all right. And it's, uh, I'll give you the long version of it, but the, it basically it's that, you know, everything that happens to you in your life, you have no control over it. There's only one thing in the world that you have control over, and that's how you react to what happens to you. That's it. That's the only thing you have control over. So if you just take that and play that one note, you know, better than anybody in the world, you'll be fine. No matter what happens to you, that the only thing you can control is how you react to it. And then the other one that I've got, you can't see it, but I got a tattooed on my arm is love it, fight it every day. And to me, that's the secret to life. No matter what comes up, you got to love it. You got to fight it every day, and but you got to do it every day. You know, every day you wake up, you you know, you maybe you're going to be tired or something. That doesn't matter. Love the fact that you're still here, and then fight back. You know, every day. So I have two now that you had to set oh, the bar high. Okay. Um, number one is, and and this speaks for everybody, but I feel this for a lot of young women. Um, be in pursuit for what sets your soul on fire. Like just do it, you know, because again, you're going to fall and you're going to have things that are going to come your way that you have to figure out. And that's what life is about is just managing it and getting through it. So if you have something that sets your soul on fire, do it and give it everything you have. And then the second one is from him dare to be remarkable. And that's something that has stuck with me in our almost 13 years of doing a morning show together that, I'm like, all right, I can do this, you know, dare to be remarkable. It says so much. That's amazing. Right. Thank you for sharing those. And then our last question is, if you each could have your own identical twin, do you think that you would want one? Uh, you know, that's a very good question because I don't know <laughs> if I could stand another me. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> but. 
but I but I could see how it would be brilliant to have somebody that's that close to you that you can you can kind of lean on and you can just kind of go through life and you're always going to have that person right there that's closer to you than anybody in the planet. Yeah. So it's it's got to be an amazing gift. Twins fascinate me. Twins, triplets, quadruplets, they fascinate me for the simple fact that whether they're identical or not, they they all share something similar, but they're all so extremely different. That's just, you know, the same with, with siblings who have the same parents, but they're completely different. I'd probably be the evil twin, so I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah, I, we think I'm the evil twin, yeah. so... All right. Well, thank you guys again so much for doing this. It was really great getting to talk to you. And we just think both of your stories and your show are so inspiring. And we know that our listeners will love getting to hear your stories as well. So thank you. Oh, yeah. And you can catch Winston and Mel on Cool 105, Monday through Friday, 530 to 10. <laughs> yes, please do. And please don't forget to subscribe to It's a Twin Thing for more inspiration. We'll talk to you guys next week. Bye.